What's up guys, welcome back to Newswave. Well, despite Black Friday being next week, it appears many different sales are already going live across the internet. So I decided to compile a bunch of them and go over all these different video game deals here today. Also, we are gonna be talking about Microsoft now responding to some of the concerns around the idea of Xbox just leaving the console and hardware space. And then we also have Final Fantasy VII Remake with that trilogy and Square Enix talking a bit more about that third game and how it seems like they're setting it up to be the most ambitious one yet. So if you guys enjoy these videos, make sure that like button helps out a ton. And if new here to the Spawn Wave channel, make sure you subscribe down below. And of course, members of the channel do get Newswave early. If you would like to learn more about that, click the join button down below this video. And we're gonna start today with Half-Life 2, which is celebrating its 20th anniversary, which it's already hard to believe that it's been 20 years since that game came out back in 2004, but here we are. In fact, it appears Valve is celebrating this in the most Valve way possible. They're giving the game away for free. Yeah, right now, at least until this afternoon seemingly, it is available for free on Steam. I recommend everyone just go and add it to your library because it's a classic title. They have this entire uh, site that's set up for it here to celebrate. And they've even done some additions here to that game. So Steam Workshop support directly within the game. They fixed some bugs, restored some content. They've added new graphics settings, updated gamepad controls, and a bunch more. Of course, gamepad controls, you can think of things like the, the Steam Deck now, with that being a big focus for Valve. They've also included episode one and episode two expansions with the base game. So again, there a lot of stuff's been added in and it's, it's just free. So I recommend checking that out. I mean, if you miss the window for that, it's $10. And I'll tell you now, Half-Life 2, 20 years later, still worth 10 bucks, definitely. So make sure you check that one out and uh, get it added to your Steam library while it's free. Also, there was a bit of controversy heading into the weekend, which I did an entire video around this. I, I knew this would be a very contentious topic with the idea of the Game Awards actually having DLC and expansions nominated for Game of the Year. This we can see was noted by Wario64, who posted what appeared to be an addition to the frequently asked questions section that mentions expansion packs, new game seasons, DLCs, remakes, and remasters all being eligible in all categories if the jury deems the new creative and technical work to be worthy of a nomination. Which I went over the idea of uh, expansion packs, DLCs, it just seems strange for that to be next to like, like just brand new games since Expansion packs and DLC typically need another game, usually an older one, uh, in order to function. And in fact, in this case, the game or the expansion people are looking towards is Shadow of the Earth Tree. That'll most likely then be nominated since it's like the highest rated release this year. And I mean, it's base game Elden Ring already won game of the year a couple of years ago. So it all kind of lines up, but it is that question of, should that be the way that Game of the Year goes at something like the Game Awards? It doesn't really matter at the end of the day because it's an award show and most people tune in for the big reveals. But still, if they want it to be taken as seriously as Jeff Keighley wants it to, you kind of got to work some of this stuff up, uh, work some of this stuff out, you know, a couple of days before nominations are announced, which is actually going to happen later on today. So we'll see how that goes. Oh, and a bit of an update and a slight correction to a previous story that had to do with Stellar Blades DLC that is coming up on the 20th. So this week, we can see this is over on their official account where they say the near DLC is paid while the rest of the photo mode and costume updates are free. At this time, we don't really know how much that near DLC is, is going to cost. It did seem kind of strange when it's when it was like being thrown around through press releases and stuff that it, it was like implied, oh, it's all free. Uh, not necessarily the case though. So some updates, we will be that come along with this on the 20th, but the collaboration for near with 2B and stuff, that uh, that it will be paid seemingly. So we'll, we'll wait and see exactly what the price point is for that as we head into this week again on the 20th when it releases. And guys, with some of the quick news out of the way, let's get into the bigger stuff. Let's start right away with a bunch of early Black Friday sales or early holiday sales. It seems like every year it's earlier and earlier and earlier, but here we are now with not only physical games that are on sale and marked down, pretty well. We also have digital games. Now the physical ones I've split up here because I understand those would probably be purchased for gifts even. So just keep that in mind, but we'll go down a list here and I'll scroll through some of the different sites and places that these are listed. So we'll start at the top here. This is with Amazon. So we have Avatar Frontiers of Pandora. That's $20. Skull and Bones. Hey, hey, if you're someone out there who's been waiting, it's 20 bucks. There you go. Persona 3 Reload is 40. Banisher's Go 
Ghost of Eden at 35. Marvel's Midnight Suns Enhanced Edition, that one's 20. Mario Rabbit's Sparks of Hope at 15. Prince of Persia, The Lost Crown. Again, these are all physical copies. They're all shipped out of Amazon, so usually they're pretty quick prime shipped. Best Buy, we have Bellatro Special Edition at $20. Tomb Raider 1 through 3 Remastered at 20 Keep in mind with Best Buy, they will get like the limited run style releases there in store, so Sometimes you can take advantage of things like holiday or Black Friday sales for them. We have the Crew Motor Fest, that one's 25. Sea of Stars at 25. Gravity Circuit, awesome game by the way, 30 bucks. Ayudin Chronicles 100 Heroes, that's 30. Madden 25 at $48. Zelda Skyward Sword at 45, very generous to Nintendo. And then we have A Quiet Place at $20. Moving over to some of the digital sales, I have Nintendo and Xbox here right now. Sony should be announcing their Black Friday sales uh, actually any time now, today or tomorrow maybe, and with that should come a bunch of digital sales that we'll go over in a separate section. But for now, we have Nintendo with a couple of digital releases that are marked down pretty well. Nickelodeon Kart Racers, that's three bucks. Untitled Goose Game at $10. Ukulele Impossible Lair at $3. That is a good pickup there. Rune Factory 4 at $9. House of the Dead Remake at six. Mortal Kombat 11 at 10. Trinity Trigger at 14. Fate Extello Link, 15, and then No More Heroes 2 at $10. Moving over to the Xbox, NBA 2K25 at $31. Hogwarts Legacy at $21. Resident Evil 4, the remake at $20. Master Chief Collection, which is an awesome deal here at $10. I know it's in Game Pass, but still, if you don't wanna have Game Pass or you're not really looking for that, I mean, the amount of Halo content here at 10 is, is like unmatched. Tekken 8, $35. A Way Out at $5. Ace Combat 7, $9. Assassin's Creed Mirage, that one's 20 bucks. Batman Return to Arkham at five, and then Arkham Knight at three. You can have that entire trilogy there for $8. That's pretty good. Bayonetta, Bayonetta and Vanquish Collection at 10. Borderlands 3 at $6. Blue Dragon Classic from the Xbox 360 days that does work on the Xbox series at $7. And then Castlevania Dominus Collection at $20. Now I wanted to point out those digital games because if you are if you have an idea of maybe getting an Xbox, say, or a, or a Switch this holiday, you could technically go on the website, buy these games, and add them to your account now, and then just take advantage of it when you do get the system later on. So definitely keep in mind for digital sales, even though you're not gonna be gifting them or receiving them as gifts physically in person. It'd still be cool to get a couple of games here and there for like three or five dollars, especially when they're marked down 80% or so. Just have something else to play, we'll say Christmas day when you unwrap a gift that you definitely didn't know you were getting. But either way, a lot of stuff is starting to pop up now for different sales. And I'll keep you guys posted on anything really, really major that pops up as we head through the holiday season. Next up, let's talk about Final Fantasy VII Remake, the trilogy with Remake and Rebirth, of course, out now. and most likely Rebirth will be nominated for Game of the Year, but I guess we'll see later on today. But now all eyes are turning towards the, the final chapter of this trilogy. Still trying to figure out what it's gonna be called exactly. Remake, Rebirth, uh, hard to say. But we, we did start to at least get some inclination as to maybe a, a big, big part of this game, which kind of teased during Rebirth, but we can see this posted up. This is over on Silicon Era saying, as part of a panel at the Korean G-Star 2024 gaming conference, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth producer Yoshinori Kates and director Naoki Hamaguchi talked about how the airship will be an important part of Final Fantasy VII Remake Part Three. This is from Hamaguchi, quote, saying, we will not cheat that with the airship system in Remake Part Three, but take the challenge head on so that it can freely fly all over the game map and I mean with Final Fantasy 7 when you get towards the end of that game you do have an airship you're like you're flying all over the place it's it was a really cool moment back in the day for the the original PlayStation at that time to have a big open map like that and go around it, it was uh it was certainly memorable in general here but uh with this I'm curious how they'll tackle this because as you play through Rebirth you start to realize it's kind of open zone it's not necessarily open world, quote unquote, because there are spots you go to that then kind of teleports you to different spaces. But if you have an airship, it's gonna be very difficult to come up with ways to keep all these different areas separated. So to me, it sounds like they would actually make a massive open world for Final Fantasy VII Remake Part Three, and that is gonna be very intriguing. Now, as we, as you kind of go through Rebirth, and I know it's been a lot of keep, uh, like, 
promotional key art and stuff where you see Aerith and then you select the big airship. Yeah, it seems like you'd, you'd really be focusing in on that for the third game. And I always wonder if that'll be like your home base sort of, and you use that to then get around the world. And maybe they have like free fly mode where you can legitimately just steer the thing around wherever you want to go. Hopefully it's not necessarily like uh, Final Fantasy X where you just kind of teleport by a menu system and that they just let you like freely explore because that could be a really impressive thing to see kind of play out in front of you. But uh, yeah, very curious about the direction of this trilogy at this time as they're looking to wrap it up. Hopefully within this generation, I assume it is because it's now moving into like full scale production. I'm sure there are plenty of assets and stuff they can use from these last two games to maybe get this third one done sooner rather than later. So personally, I'm looking towards I'm gonna say 2027 to get this thing out there, but who knows, maybe if it's this ambitious, could fall into 2028. As long as it gets out and done before the end of this generation, they can wrap it all up here with the PS5, I'll, I'll be good. Next up, let's talk about Microsoft and their, this is an Xbox campaign that has so far spurred on a bunch of conversations around Microsoft looking for an exit if you will, from, from the console space, creating hardware. They're much more interested in making software, which, I mean, yeah, most of these first party platform holders like to make software because if done correctly and on a large enough install size can make a lot of money. But from what we're seeing with Microsoft, they're going to the next level and they are taking some of their first party properties and moving it to other systems. And it seems like plans are actually accelerating right now behind the scenes for that. So naturally the question comes up if they are going to stick with hardware going forward. Well, Phil Spencer did talk with Rolling Stone and we can see some of the quotes here where he says, it's an interesting topic because as we look at the brand, as we're changing the brand, it means something different. It literally was a box when it first launched. It was the direct Xbox. What it's grown into now is more accessibility. Xbox isn't just one device. Xbox Xbox is on your smart TV, Xbox is on your phone, Xbox is on your PC, and we're in the middle of that transition. Our biggest growth in Xbox players is on PC and cloud. The console space all up isn't growing across all of them. We love those customers, but in terms of continuing to expand and grow Xbox, it's about PC, it's about cloud, and it's about making our games more available in more places. But again, when pressed about hardware, he said, we'll definitely do more consoles in the future and other devices. So none of this is that shocking. It, it's pretty clear that Microsoft, what they've been trying to do is sort of reform the brand and move it away from just a singular box. Now you can look at that and say, well, yeah, they're having a hard time selling consoles like they used to with say the Xbox 360, which at this time appears to be the high watermark in general for, for Microsoft when it comes to selling a game console. And ever since then, it's been, it's been tough. And the Xbox series hasn't exactly been outpacing the Xbox One. And in fact, it seems all too likely that it's going to come up short of the Xbox One in terms of its lifetime sales. But because Microsoft now is looking around realizing that they can make a lot of money by putting their games on other platforms and not have to produce as many systems, in their mind, well, that okay, Xbox isn't just a console anymore, it's an app. Like that's kind of where they are with the branding at this time. And that's sort of like, hey, this is an Xbox. This is an Xbox because they don't want you to call an Xbox an Xbox, right? They want you to call your laptop an Xbox and, and, and so on. It's, the branding is, uh, it sounds straightforward at first, but then you realize that there's no, there's no app store ready yet. Like the Xbox store is not available yet on mobile devices like they were pushing for at this time. And a lot of it just relies on cloud, which also I don't think is ready for mainstream consumption as it's still seemingly in beta. So they still have a lot of work to go on that end and they have to get their mobile store vision figured out, which was supposed to be ready in July. So the marketing campaign that we're seeing now that probably took seven or eight months to put together does make sense if that came to fruition. Just hasn't yet. Maybe they'll get it out before the end of this year or maybe it's something they're gonna start up 2025 with and everything we're seeing right now is just them setting the, the foundation for, for things going forward. But at least it seems that they still will be making different pieces of hardware, which the way you answer the question, sounds like handhelds as well are probably on the docket. So they'll probably have a dedicated box and then also a handheld system to going forward. Now, will they keep doing that? I mean, probably they still do surface laptops. I don't think those exactly light the world on fire compared to HP or Dell or Samsung or any other laptop makers, but they still make them. And yeah, I think they'll still be making at the bare minimum, box, handheld, 
Maybe they come up with something else, we'll see. And in our last bit of news, let's talk about a Splinter Cell movie that was more than a decade apparently in the making that Go Figure has actually been canceled now. And I kind of feel like most people figured it wasn't going to be a thing because it's been floated for so long, but I guess just some closure here, we can see this was an exclusive over on the direct. This is from the producer Basil. I, th I think your last name I'd probably butcher pretty badly. So we'll stick with that. They say, quote, that movie, that being Splinter Cell, would have been awesome. Just couldn't get it right. Script wise, budget wise, but it was going to be great. We had a million different versions of it, but it was going to be hardcore and awesome. That's one of the ones that got away, which is really sad. Uh, yeah, I assume the producer was really pushing for what seems to be more than a decade to get this thing at least greenlit and get the budget on it. Probably thought it was awesome. I mean, they said it multiple times here. Sure. Who, who really knows though? But I will say, I feel like a spy, espionage, action sort of movie, that should work well with Splinter Cell. Like, I, that's the thing, it, fe it feels like the formula, the template has been done over and over and over again. Maybe that was the issue. It could also be scheduling where you're trying to cast certain actors and actresses and it's not all coming together for you. Or just in general, you're trying to pitch it to the big companies that would produce or give you the money to do it and it just wasn't clicking for them. But the thing with this is there are other projects right now with Splinter Cell. Like there's an entire, I think, Netflix series. I think September, we got a trailer for it. So we should see that soon. And that's where I would prefer a lot of this stuff go, especially for... Splinter Cell, while I, I, I feel like live action could work, animated just seems to be a better path forward for these different games that are trying to remind people they exist again since they seem to roll out on Netflix and, and, and Amazon and stuff quite frequently and they seem to have worked so far. So we'll see with Splinter Cell's adaptation coming up soon and remember that remake is still in the works. So if they can have them hit around the same time we'll see because i think the game is going to be later on but like in the same year ish that can certainly play off each other as we've seen even with fallout recently that was an incredible success on the streaming side it actually helped quite substantially when it came to the games even borderlands the movie which was by all accounts terrible seems that gearbox is pretty happy with the number of new users that came over and checked out the game so even if it's bad it at least still just brings exposure to the games which most of the time are at least good and before we go to the comments of the day we'll take a look at the poll that i posted up yesterday where i ask should an expansion or dlc for a game be considered for game of the year nomination wow 86 percent say no 14 percent say yes yeah, I agree with the no, actually. I just, it's, it's, it's just not computing for me with that. So many people I saw in the comments were saying, hey, there should be an entire section for expansion and DLC. And I think the concern there is, I think the concern is that uh, there, there wouldn't be enough DLC or expansions that would be up to a certain standard because they even have like caveats with that newness, price point and stuff that could be nominated. I think they're, they're, issue is, hey, if there's not enough, how do we even fill this category out? And to me, if that's the case, you just you just don't have the, the category. I don't know what their fascination is with having 40 some odd categories, giving out these, these trophies all over the place. It's, if there's not enough, there's not enough. And that's just kind of it. You could lump in remasters, DLC expand, just kind of have like this catch-all bucket for these different games that can't fit into certain categories. You could do that. It just seems strange to me to see an expansion or a DLC up there next to some of these like brand new original games that are, aren't playing off of maybe a past game of the year winner even with something like Elden Ring. So it's gonna be strange because I think most of us assume Erdtree is absolutely getting nominated and I think we're gonna see that here in a few hours. And we'll finish up with the comment of the day as you're seeing here. This is from GameFAQs who says, I'd rather know how many PS5 Pros logged into the PSN network. Scalpers are being counted in these sales numbers. I mean, scalpers get counted in like every every console release. I mean, do you think Nintendo's gonna launch the Switch too and no scalpers are gonna be there working to pump the numbers up? The thing's gonna sell out, obviously, but something like this where it is a more substantial jump than say uh, a slim revision, yeah, it's gonna be affected by scalpers. That's just the way it goes, especially with a lot of this, these sales happening online. There just seems to be a lot of people having a harder time accepting that, oh, okay, maybe people were interested in this PS5 Pro more so than we were expecting. As we saw again in Japan, it seems to have uh, eclipsed the PS4 Pro's initial numbers. But keep in mind, sales momentum can slow over time or even after the first month or two, the first holiday even. So I don't expect these to be numbers that the PS5 Pro keeps up. I'm more curious if it can actually end up outpacing the PS4 Pro completely. Could the PS5 Pro, a 
much more expensive system than the PS4 Pro, even inflation being accounted for, could it outsell it? That would be an interesting message to send to Sony that maybe a $700 price point for a mid-gen console isn't a problem. Does that mean for the PS6, could we have like a, an $800 mid-gen refresh? Could we have $1,000? How far can this be pushed for the enthusiast market? I'm sure that's something Sony's at least thinking about right now. Keep in mind though, for the initial release of say a PlayStation 6, Sony would still need to start from scratch, start from zero. So they would probably work to subsidize a good portion of that console from day one. So I wouldn't expect the PlayStation 6 to launch at like $1,000, even $700 at this time. But I wouldn't be shocked if it was like, 600 bucks. That's just kind of the way we've been trending for these game consoles, especially recently. And ladies and gentlemen, that's going to do it here for Newswave. If you enjoyed this video, guys, hit that like button. If not, hit the dislike. Leave comments down below about everything we talked about here today. If you missed yesterday's Newswave, I'll leave it up here in a card. Or maybe you did want to talk a bit more about the idea of DLC or expansions being nominated for Game of the Year. I had an entire video dedicated to that, and I'll leave it right below. Thanks, guys, for watching, and I'll see you next time.